thank you for the kind introduction. Excellencies, friends, brothers and sisters. Jashtala. I'm sorry, my Tibetan is a little more than this. But I rely on my son to wash away this uh, shame. He is doing volunteer work at uh, TCV, where he is trying to learn the Tibetan language, hopefully. He can do a good job. Uh, it is a great honor for me to speak at the Central Tibetan Administration to my dear Tibetan brothers and sisters, for whom I have much admiration and uh, great respect and deep love. Sitting here, I cannot but have a fix of four feelings. Shameful, encouraged, proud, and recommitted. Shameful because our Tibetan brothers and sisters and parallel sufferings have been at the hand of the regime consisting predominantly of the Han Chinese of which I am a member. Encouraged because given such a stark fact as such, His Holiness and the Tibetan people are still so generously kind to open their arms to embrace us and call us brothers. And proud because I myself have chosen to stand on the righteous side regardless of my own ethnicity. And I have been fighting side by side with my Tibetan brothers and sisters for more than two decades for a free Tibet. And recommitted today, given the situation in Tibet, given the spate of self emulations that shock the whole world, I feel more determined than ever to continue to fight this good fight together with you. Today, I'm supposed to talk about China politics. Before I enter the topic, I propose to have a moment of a silence for the 42 martyrs who briefly sacrificed their lives in, most, in the most painful way to speak out the voice of Tibetans. Let's have a moment of silence. End of silence. Please be seated. It is um, one, one thirty, almost one thirty a.m. in U.S. So forgive me if I forget something. <laughs> I speak slow. It's a, a, a really a sleep time for me. China politics takes hundreds of uh, PhD dissertations to, to research, and maybe another hundreds of books to talk about. <coughs> and you lay them end to end, you cannot reach, even reach a sure conclusion. It is really complicated. 
difficult topic. And it is also a topic that everybody can have a, an opinion. So today, I just, le just let me offer my two cents. The year 1989 has become a reference point to, for one to look at the recent history of China. We all know in 1989 Tiananmen uh, democracy movement, the Chinese people courageously stood up against the government uh, corruption. And that they stood up for democracy and freedom. The image of the lone man standing in the string of tanks shocked the whole world and the entire, the entire humanity. And our fallen brother's spirit have been one of the greatest source of inspiration for continued struggle for these goals in China. But we all know the movement ended in bloodshed. The Tiananmen massacre created a very strong sense of fear of political engagement among ordinary people with the fear, indifference, and cynicism soon have become a fashionable in China. And hopes for a public system of checks and balance against government abuse were swept away by the bloodletting of June 4th, 1989. But 1989 also created fear and a crisis within the Communist Party, within the Communist regime. Life was no longer the same for the rulers. The rulers had to develop new tactics to meet its overwhelming need to preserve the stability. The Soviet Union disintegrated and the Eastern Europe being blocks opened up. This cast even heavier cloth over the head of the Chinese Communist officials. Everybody was asking, how long could the communists stay in power? <coughs> but shortly after Deng Xiaoping's famous Southern inspection in 1982, communist uh, officials at all levels realized the three realities. The first reality was the CCP, the, the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP's hold on power had nothing to do with the communist principles. So the Communist Party becomes communist without communism. Second, continued economic growth was the last best hope to keep the ship afloat. They have to use every way possible to beef up the economic growth, whatever whatever possible. The third reality was the elite must be spoiled to retain their loyalty. The government have to exchange the loyalty from officials, from intellectuals, from elite by spoiling them, by giving them opportunity to corrupt. Now corruption was accepted endorsed and even demanded. This is the three realities uh, that the party officials understood not long after Tiananmen massacre. Understanding these three realities over the past 20 years, the CCP regime established which I call two China structure. Two China structure, I'm not, not talking about mainland China and Taiwan. I'm talking about mainland China. One of the two Chinas, which I call China Incorporated, China Inc. is a big company. <coughs> China Inc. is formed through the following ways. Number one, the so-called red capitalist. I think everybody have heard this term, red capitalist the communist officials turned into capitalists. 
because they were the people who closed to the public resources. Embezzlement helped them become overnight capitalists. Number two, China Inc. was formed through the marriage of power and capital. Power and capital combined closely, taking advantage of the following low human rights standards, low environmental protection, low wages, and banning collective bargaining power. If you are a capitalist, you know very well this is the best place to do investment, where you don't have to worry about how pe people's well-being. You don't have to worry about whether the workers will stand up against bad working conditions, low wages. You don't have a worry. All you have to worry is a good relationship with the government. So, the marriage of power and money become the, the major factor for the formation of China Inc. And in late 1990s, after long time debate, whether China is still, was still a socialist or capitalist, the leaders of China understood he, they had to open up the shares of China Inc. to capitalists at the 16th National Party's Congress. Party's National Congress, they passed a, a charter to open the membership to capitalists, which is irony, because communists are supposed to be well, vanguards of proletariat. So you, you studied in uh, Russia, I mean Soviet Union, you know this <laughs> slogan, right? Uh, but capitalists can be a, 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 com a communist party member. So that's irony, but leaders become so pragmatic that they open up the memberships to capitalists. So I describe it as China Inc. open its shares to capitalists. And also, the Chinese leadership understood not long after the massacre, they had to buy silence by silence. They cannot suppress. Coercion cannot work as well as buying off. So before the massacre, the opposition came mainly from intellectuals. So soon after the massacre, they came up with a policy to co-opt the officials, I mean the, the intellectuals. So I describe it as in China's ink share free to intellectuals. And I don't want to go through many, many numbers, but the reality is in today's China, power, the officials, capital, the business elite, and the intellect, the intellect in the intellectual elite are bonded together with adhesive of corruption. China Inc. Now is dazzling the entire world with its wealth, might, and glory. If you travel to the United States, for example, you can easily run into a group of Chinese who become the major purchasing power in US, Europe. They buy all the high quality, expensive goods. So this is a the face of China Inc., which is dazzling the whole world, the entire world. And the China Inc. dominates the public discourse so that the outside world, outside observers believe that China Inc. <coughs> represents the whole of China. You can run into foreigners very easily who will tell you, oh, China is so wonderful, it's rising up. And those people are so wealthy. 
But the truth is, there is another society in China, which is also called China, a society of over a billion Chinese, a billion China, who are virtually slave laborers working for China Inc. This is China, the Chinese government does not want outside world to see. Remember in 2008, when they have a big show, the Olympics, they project China to the whole world. You know, China is so powerful, so wealthy, and it's, you know, so civilized. And <coughs> at the same time, they apply martial law on China and drove all the so-called you know, migrant workers out of China. You know, that China is China, the Chinese government does not want people to see. Okay, here you are. One side of the coin is elite corporate China, which I just talked about. The other side is what I call, listen carefully, I call it China of citizens, not citizens. This, this is really bad word, which I coined, the term I coined. The China of a citizen. I'm not a proud that I coined this term, tell you the truth. But this term is based on a true story, <coughs> true Chinese story. On October 29th, 2008, 8 p.m., a government official, party secretary Lin, violently harassed an 11-year-old girl in front of her parents on a busy street in Shenzhen. When the girl's parents tried to stop him and passers-by protested against him, he shouted, how dare are you getting in my way? Do you guys know who I am? I'm a representative from a central ministry of transportation in Beijing. I'm ranked as high as your mayor in this government. You guys are just as dispensable and worthless as a piece of shit in front of me. The incident and Secretary Lin's language quickly circulated on the internet and Ever since then, numerous people have sarcastically begun calling themselves Chinese citizens to show their discontent and despair. To preserve my respect for ordinary people in China, I will minimize use the term that I coined. So I will call another China the under China. Here is how these two China diverge. These two China separate so much and preceded it. Number one, I'm preceding the wealth gap between the two. You heard so many stories about that. I just give you one number. 0.4% of families in China owned 70% of national wealth. See how serious the gap, how big the gap is. Number two, citizens are no citizens. The citizens of under China are able to enjoy basic benefit of economic growth, a fast economic growth, or constitutionally afforded civil rights. Number three, the elite China monopoly over power capital, and the information makes the mobility from one China to another China nearly impossible. Social mobility is stagnant. And number four, the two China no longer speak a common political language. If you get, some of you understand Chinese. If you get online, you will find the ordinary people speak one language and the officials speak another. And ordinary people create a lot of terms they use to describe 
the political situation and events. And the official language use different, totally another system. So two Chinas no longer speak the common political language. Okay, number five. The two Chinas have almost no common political life. I just mentioned Olympics in 2008. Olympics took place under martial law. That means this is a party only for us, not for you, right? No common political life. If you get online, you can find more and more Chinese citizens have resentment against the, of national festival days and you know, the government uh, activities. More and more resentment. And number six, the two societies have grown more and more distrustful of each other. Very distrustful of each other. Okay, I just very sketchily, briefly tell you the structure. I have a lot of uh, statistics to support what I'm saying. I don't want to go to that detail. And the next question is, how does the CCP regime maintain the two China structure? How does the government maintain it? We all understand all autocratic rulers use violence and a liar and lie to maintain, uh, maintain their rule. But on top of traditional lies and violence, which every autocratic ruler uses, the CCP in the past 20 years has developed new tactics. It is comp comprised in the shape of a dragon. China, I mean, Chinese people like to call themselves dragons. I say this comprised in the shape of a dragon. Their strategies. The body. The body is sustaining economic growth at all costs to maintain the regime's ruling legitimacy. If the economy slows down, the regime has problem. So the, the, the regime has only source of legitimacy that is a fast economic growth, which is called performance-related, <coughs> performance-based legitimacy. You may not like me, but when I rule, economic expands, and your living standard raised up. So I don't expect you love me, but I have to continue rule. That's their philosophy in recent years. So that's the body, economic growth. And two wins. One is appeasing the elite, spoiling the elite with corruption and suppressing the powerless with rock police. You may have heard a lot of stories, the rock police, how they suppress, how repressive the regime against the ordinary people, even the vendors on the street. And two clouds, I have never seen a dragon, I don't know how many clouds a dragon has. But anyway, one is purging citizen advocate. I call those people who try to integrate to China based on justice and universal human rights <coughs> values. I call them a citizen advocate. But those people have been purged, like Liu Xiaobo. So two clouds, one is purging citizen advocate like Liu Xiaobo and the other blocking public opinion, blocking information, censor internet. This is a this is a so-called stability preserving system that the Chinese regime has taken pains to establish over the past 20 years. This system siphons more public resources than national defense and it becomes the final defense line for the regime. And people often talk about who are 
reformists in the regime who are conservatives. I tell you, nowadays, there's only one faction in China, I mean, in China's top, uh, leader, lead, uh, leadership. That is the faction of uh, stability preservers. So everybody agreed they must have such a system. That's their strongest consensus. OK, now the question is, where the breakthrough will take place? Where the hope is? If you examine China closely, you will find that in recent years, the direct political persecution has become increasingly less. Direct persecu political persecution become less and less. The reason being, the Chinese regime is on the defense in the field of politics. The concepts of democracy and human rights have prevailed in the mind of the Chinese people, including the elite. The Chinese leaders understand very well democracy is a good thing, how democracy works. But people differ on when and how to, from, to, to go from here to democracy. Now China ran into a vicious cycle. I was just talking about the stability preserving system, which every leader agrees to have. Now they ran into a vicious cycle. They have to keep uh, stability. To keep stability, they have to stream government power. The officials use the power to exploit people economically, which in turn cause more unrest from ordinary people, more protest, which is considered to be instable elements. For that, the government have to increase the power to keep stability. That strength again, the officials. Officials use the power to exploit again. So they, they actually go in this uh, wish, vicious cycle. That is why you see every day, you open the uh, thing on the TV, open the paper, you see protest here, protest there. In China, each year, 180,000 protests participate by more than 100 people take place in each year. That means every three minutes, there's another one. And so far, Chinese government has been very successful in dividing them, preventing them from becoming a, a big one. That is their first defense line. And a lot of people want to know the moment of opening for the democratic transition. Nobody can predict with uh, precision, but we can analyze it. I think the moment of opening for democratic transition is most likely to arrive when five, the following five elements come together, five elements. <coughs> Number one, a robust plurality of this affected and discontent citizen. Put it simply, this cross-border opposition, discontent, dissatisfaction with the government, number one. Number two, a crisis. So it takes crisis. What is crisis? Any event, any catalytic event that send a signal to scatter the social forces, that the time has come to, to rise up. So that crisis. And third, a viable opposition. What does that mean? We see so many protests, but we don't see viable opposition. So protests are either suppressed or by off. So we have so far not been able to transform these scattered protests into a long-lasting movement demanding for overall change. So we need that, we need viable opposition. Number four, 
a split in the leadership. So Bush Elias event can be considered a split in the leadership. But what the government do right after that is to try to make it an individual isolated event and prevent any com trouble from coming into the top leadership to any one of the nine on the top. Five, number five element, that is an international consensus to press for the open up or support for democratic transition. So far, international community has no such consensus. They know co such consensus as when, where to press China to open up. So the, the, the five elements above that I just described should come together for the moment of opening up to arrive. To look at these five elements, we need to look at another five variables. How we make the five elements to present at the same time. The number one factor is citizen power. Citizen power. Without citizen power, nobody wants to change. If you are in, you in power, without pressure, you will not change. So we need a viable opposition from the citizen. We really need a citizen power. But citizen power is not only about Chinese democracy movement. When I talk about citizen power, if we talk about currently that exists in, under the PRC and the People's Republic of China, we should also include Tibetans, Uyghurs, Mongolians into it. Because these ethnic groups have so far uh, created the most of the powerful pressure on the Chinese government. So that's part of a citizen power. We need to combine this power together. And in the past uh, two decades, I my, myself and many colleagues uh, work together with Tibetans and Uyghurs and Mongolian, trying to bring those forces together to engage real discussion, real exchange, and work for the common future. In the sense that without democratizing in China, none of us will have a future. So the, when I say citizen power, I talking about across board a citizen power. That's the first factor we have to look at. The second factor, is the party politics. The most important development in recent uh, three decades in Chinese Communist Party politics is the introduction of term limit and succession. With that in place, the top leader's authority is diminishing one after another, one after another. You, you understand politics. When the number one guy's authority dimish, diminishes and the other faction will become more pronounced, their protest, their discontent will more and more open. So this process is continued. Recent Bush Lassie incident is a very good example the significance about the, this event is just this. A lot of people misunderstood, thinking that the struggle is about ideas. No, not at all. It is not about ideas. It's not about, about, not about party lines. It is about power. It's a power struggle. But what is different from uh, the previous power struggle is that this power struggle has become more transparent. Why it becomes so transparent? Because the authority of the top leader diminished to that point. Everybody can say no. 
Nobody can control another. So we will see this split tendency to continue. With the first factor I was just talking about, the citizen power, the pressure from the people, and this split, split, and power, strong, I mean, uh, pressure, pressure, we want to see this process going. Okay, another factor we have to look at <coughs> is ethnic politics, I call ethnic politics, by which I mean the relationship between the Chinese with the Tibetans, Uyghurs, and uh, Mongolians. Tibetan, for example, has the most systematic movement for many decades, have most international attention, which in turn apply tremendous pressure on the Chinese government. So to me, I think it is a part of very significant part of people's power, which will apply pressure from within. But one thing we should be very careful, Chinese government has been trying to seize every opportunity possible to use the Tibetan cause, the Uyghur cause, or Mongolia cause to scare, are you scared the, the Han Chinese deter them from pursuing for democracy. They would present a picture to them. If the control of the Communist Party loosen up, this group will split up. Then China will become divided. The majority of the Chinese would think that is a serious problem. That's the reality. I'm just talking about reality. Chinese government will not uh, spare any opportunity like that. So we should be very, very careful. I, as an individual, I respect the Tibetan as a people who have every right to determine your own future. But for the real politics in China, I think His Holiness, the Dalai Lama's middle way approach is still the best approach, at least for the time being. We should be very, very alert and sensitive to this. And another factor we have to look at is the, the small Chinas, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau. They, you know, they have some kind of a separation, a separation to a degree with China. Each of them actually have a pressure on the government, on the Chinese government, on China, and each has its own unique influence on China, each will play a very important role in China. So that's the factor we have to look at. Just look at what happened a few days ago in Hong Kong. 400,000 people took to the street protecting against the Fu Jintao's visit, which is a phenomenon. <coughs> so that shows us Hong Kong, Taiwan, the Macau are, are our ally, allies, friends, for democracy in mainland China. So that fact we should not overlook. The fourth act, the, the, the last but not the least, the fifth one is international relations. So far, the Tibetans, I'm talking about the, uh, the democracy forces in PRC, People's Republic of China. So far, Tibetans have uh, the best international relations. The internal relations is very subtle. Nowadays, no government will come to your rescue, say, I will support the Tibetans you know, at all our costs, and self-immolation, we will uh, you know, uh, uh, stand very strongly uh, with you against the government uh, continued persecution, uh, repressive policy in Tibet. They won't do that. They won't do that for obvious reason, which which is, um, is a shame, but we have to ad admit this is a reality for which, about which we can do little or no, nothing. But that does not mean 
the relationship with various countries, with the international groups, is not important. They are very important because the first step have, has to be taken by ourselves. We have to take the first step to make the situation in, make the whole thing into the situation where the international com community is willing to do something. When they are willing to do something, this relationship we established in the past will become very effective, very important. Because nobody want to be out of the whole picture when the critical moment comes, especially US, European countries, the world power. They all want to have some influence. So nowadays, what we do will not be in vain. So that is the fifth factor, international relations. Now, I'm talking about so many things. I want to summary briefly. Number one task for all of us is build up people power. Without that, nothing can be accomplished. Number two, China's top leader politics is very interesting because the top leader's authority is in the process of diminishing. It will continue dimin diminish, especially with the growth of the people's power. When there's a big scale demonstration, the split will take place for, for sure. One of faction or another will have no choice but to seek support from uh, people. They have to seek uh, support from people, not for others, just for the power struggle, they have to do that. So that's the when the opportunity comes. Okay, when big demonstration takes place, when big moment comes, we need a group of leaders from the people who can have the four functions. Number one, trusted by people. Number two, can act as a true voice of people. Number three, able to disrupt political order and engage negotiation with the state. Number four, able to mobilize international support, uh, attention and support. We need such a group without Tiananmen Square. In Tiananmen Square, we, don't, we didn't have such a group. That's why we failed. We need such a group. So through the work we do today, such group will emerge. That's very important. And for the China's future, I think I always talk about revolution, democratic revolution 3.0. We have uh, one, one force, that's people's power. Another force is state. We cannot overlook the state for the transition because they are in power. And point five from Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Macau, and point five from the internal community. So this is the Democratic Revolution 3.0. And uh, that's what I want to offer you. And I'm, uh, uh, I will stay for questions and answers. And I, th I think I talked too much already. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat>